it's a little uncomfortable, right, dealing with politicians, getting to know them, which is why we call our program here today learning how to hug a porcupine building relationships with lawmakers and why it's important to do so. It's a little uncomfortable, right? You know, getting your hands around that little beast, that porcupine. But it's, as you've heard earlier today, it's essential to do that. So to kick off today's program, I'll give you a little bit of like, what's like life in Congress like? What is it like to be behind the scenes a member of Congress? I worked for 13 years on Capitol Hill. I've literally worked as a reporter, a consultant, and a staffer for a member of Congress um, for 32 years. I've been in Washington, D.C., and I'm going to give you a little bit of an insider view. And to start off, I'm going to tell you, it's not like it's portrayed in the movies. It really isn't like that. This is from House of Cards, you know, a bunch of white guys sitting there drinking scotch late at night and laughing. It really isn't like that. It's a little bit more like this. This is a congressman getting ready for bed. Um, I literally have been in an office where a staff member, member had gone home for the weekend um, and he said, look at what I got to deal with. And he opens up a file cabinet and he shows the guy's dirty laundry is sitting there. You know, he's got to deal with. This is what life is really like for members of Congress. The average number of meetings that they have on a daily basis is 13 meetings a day. That's average. A bad day goes up to 18 meetings a day. Um, they're... Uh, Staff will have another maybe 12, 13, 14 meetings a day, which means that the average number of meetings in a congressional office goes to 27 meetings a day. That's really incredible that we think about that you go through 27 meetings when you, in, in, in an office. If you want to drill down, we didn't sign this as reading material, but we can send you a link to this. The Congressional Management Foundation has issued a new publication, a job description for members of Congress. And it sounds crazy. And we felt a little embarrassed a few years ago when we looked at our website and we had job descriptions for every position on Capitol Hill, except the member. And so we put this together with the uh, help of a lot of different experts in this field. So we'll send this around as link. It's pretty interesting. And one of the things you'll find, it is a really grueling job that the average work week for a member of Congress when they're in session is 70 hours a week. And when they're out of session, it's 59 hours a week. Now remember, I'm talking about their work ethic, not their work product. I'm perfectly aware that the American public is not really pleased with how they're doing their jobs, but what you have to do is appreciate that the human being that you're going to be building this relationship with is working really grueling hours. I work a lot with freshman lawmakers, and I usually wait for around May or June or July to ask the chief of staff, when did your boss start hating her job? And she said, around March, you know, when they figured out they're, you know, gaining weight, they're not eating right, they're not sleeping, you know, it's really a challenge. And that's when it really comes uh, in light to them that this is really going to be a tough job. The other thing that's changed in Washington in the 30 years that I've been here is they go home a lot more. They don't move to D.C. with their families. Eight out of ten members of Congress go home. And it's a personal decision. There's a little political decision as well that they want to like, not be accused of going Washington. Here's just to give you a real insider look. Here's a schedule for a member of Congress for the U.S. House of Representatives that we were able to get access to. I've changed some of the information here um, to, that uh, will show you uh, a little bit of what a day is like for a member of Congress. You can see they start the day going to and speaking to an association. They then have a hearing. Notice that there's an overlap. Same time they have a hearing, they're supposed to be also at a classified briefing. That's very common for members of Congress to have um, double booked. Um, they'll go to caucuses in midday. They often will meet as a big group. They'll be meeting with other people who are part of the association. Um, they have nonprofits and constituents coming through their office every day. Um, and this is just an average day for a member of Congress. Usually starts around 7 o'clock in the morning, usually ends around 9 o'clock at night. Now, the other thing that's changed in congressional offices in the years that I've been here is, the, as I said earlier, the internet changed the economics of advocacy. You don't need a piece of paper and a postage stamp to communicate with your member of Congress. You can do it virtually free by the internet. Well, what that has caused is an explosion in grassroots advocacy. Let me give you one illustration of this from a congressional office that we were able to track. The incoming communications to this office from 2001 to 2017. In 2001, the, the total number of communications that this office got was 9,300 communications. 9, 300 communications. By 2011, that number had gone up to about 43,000. I swear I do this for a living. Um, and then by 2017, that number had gone up to 123,000. 
Now, what we're tracking at the Congressional Management Foundation is this doesn't mean that grassroots is getting more powerful. It's actually getting less powerful. Identical mass email campaigns, which was the staple of advocacy from associations and nonprofits in the 2000s, is no longer having the impact it does. What does have impact? Grass tops. People like you. Because you're making the extra effort. You're going to be able to connect with your member of Congress. By the way, I want to point out that this period of time, during this period of time where this communication has gone up, the number of full-time staff members has remained static at 16, around 18 full-time staff members. It's set by law. And that law was passed in 1974. Just to put that in perspective, in 1974, just what was it like in 1974? Gerald Ford was president of the United States. The Godfather Part Two was in the theaters, and gas cost 55 cents a gallon. You've heard about this growth in government. It hasn't happened in Washington, at least in the US Congress. In fact, total staffing in the US Congress has dropped 15% since the 1980s, while US population has gone up 50%. I don't know any industry that could see a 50% increase in the number of customers they have to serve while cutting their resources by 1, 5, 15%. So that's a challenge. Now, let's talk a little bit about what they're looking for and what works and what doesn't work in communicating with Congress. Here's one example of an attempt to interact with Congress. Someone wrote this letter to a member of Congress, real letter. It said, Dear Congressman Bartlett, I voted for you three times. I think you're wonderful. Please send me $900 at once so I can buy an icebox and repaint my car. P.S. There's a P.S. here. The three times I voted for you were in the election of 1946. <laughs> now, let's go into it a little more granular. One of the things that the Congressional Management Foundation is able to do is, because we have a relationship with Congress, is conduct surveys of congressional staff. And you're going to see a lot of our survey data both today and over the next uh, three months, four months. Because this is really telling you an, a, a factual picture of what's going on in Congress. Not what's on the front page of USA Today or the Rochester Democrat in Conoco or the Sacramento Bee, but actual anonymous surveys that we've been doing with congressional staff for the 40 years we've been in existence. And one of the best questions we've asked uh, over these years goes like this. If your member or senator has not arrived at a firm decision on an issue, how much influence might the following advocacy strategies directed to the Washington office have on his or her decision? Now let me unpack this a little bit. Why do we say if your member of Congress has not arrived at a firm decision on an issue, why do we couch it that way? Well, when we were designing the survey, and we always do focus groups or interviews, and I was doing a focus group back in 2002 when we first created this question, and I asked chiefs of staff, what would get your boss to change her position on a bill? And the most common answer I got was a gun to her head. Because they're told day one, don't flip flop, right? So we realized if we didn't, when we asked this question of them without this caveat at the beginning, we didn't get very good data. In fact, we got almost no data. But then we put this caveat and we got great data. And here's what we found out we found out that um, postcards, form emails, petitions, um, Seth? Thanks. Yep. Um, the form, form emails, postcards, petitions um, just doesn't do the evil. Petitions, same thing. Group social media, we'll talk more about social media later. Um, visits from lobbyists, that's pretty good. 8% says it has a lot of influence. Uh, phone calls, comments during telephone town hall meetings. 18% has a lot of influence. We'll talk more about telephone town hall meetings. Letter to the editor, a little bit better. Local editorial with an issue um, that is pending before, 26%. Individualized emails, now we're getting into some things that really matter. Individualizing these communications, and we're going to talk a lot about that, is essential. I talked about how mass email campaigns are waning as an influence tool, but please, this is a very important distinction. I'm talking about identical mass emails. They literally go into a different pile than those individualized. But at the top of the chart, what we're looking at is contact from a constituent's representative and in-person visits from constituents. Your meetings, your interactions with them, when you sit down with them, is the most valuable and important tool in a citizen advocate's toolkit. And when we defined it in the survey, what is a representative? What's a constituent's representative? We defined it as a representative from an association, nonprofit, or company in the district or state. That is everybody in this room. You can talk about the number of realtors who you represent. You can talk about the number of customers and clients that you've served. You can talk about the number of people in the community that are gonna be affected if flood insurance isn't worked out on a, on a long-term basis. So you're able to talk about this in an intelligent way. One staff member said this, 
Nothing replaces face-to-face -face interacting with, congressional, with staff. Now, to give us an even more uh, tactile uh, example of this, we're going to bring in some videos for you. We interviewed congressional staff, talking about what worked and what didn't work. This is Charlie Keller. He was deputy chief of staff to Bob Goodlatte of Virginia. He's now chief of staff to a freshman uh, lawmaker. And we asked Charlie what worked, what didn't work when it came to identical mass email campaigns. Is this really having some impact? And this is what Charlie said. Uh, for the most part, email campaigns uh, of same basic form letter are almost useless for our office, and I think most offices discount them to a certain extent. Uh, the best communication that you can have is personalized, and the more effort that you put into it to tell your story, um, phone calls, in-person conversations, uh, writing an actual letter is the, is the best thing that you can do. It guarantees you will get attention, you will get a formalized response. But if you and 400 of your friends all click something off of a website and it comes in, uh, it is not given the attention that you think it is. So what lesson do we take from that? That means sometime in the next five months there may be an effort by the realtors from the Washington office to say, please send a message to Congress you're going to personalize that message. You're going to put it right at the top. Why put it at the top? Because they don't read the whole letter. They don't have time. Remember you saw, they're getting 123,000 communications. That's on the high end. Most offices don't get that many. They get on average 50,000. But still, they're still not going to read the whole letter. So you put it right at the top. You're going to personalize that communication in a way that's going to get their attention. So what are they looking for? What kind of information does Congress want from constituents? Well, it's really basic. There's four things they're looking for. What they want to know is, what actions do the constituents want me to take? Why do they want me to do that? What are the current and or potential local impacts? And what are the constituents' personal stories connected to this? And you're going to hear a lot about storytelling this afternoon when Seth Turner both shows you and walks you through an exercise on how to craft your personal story, because we know that storytelling is really powerful. So let me go a little granular and drill down a little deeper on what they're looking for specifically beyond this. One of the questions that we've asked in our survey goes like this. How helpful is it for messages from constituents to include the following? And by the way, we say here messages from constituents. We ask the same question regarding how helpful is it for social media content? How helpful is it when you meet with them in the district? We got the same top four answers over and over again. So we say, OK, we got this down. But then in the last survey we recently did with congressional offices, we asked a follow-up question changing one word in the question. How frequently do messages from constituents include the following? You see where I'm going here? Because if you've got stuff that's really helpful and it's not very frequent, you've got a strategy for differentiating yourself from the other 100,000 communications coming in. And this is what the data showed us, is what we found is they're looking for information about the impact on the district state. 91% said that would be helpful. 9% said they get it frequently. This is where your national office comes in. You're going to get some of the best granular data that you can use to communicate information to that legislator on either a district basis, county basis, state basis. But they're going to provide you that. And that is, as you can see here, an incredibly valuable asset. But what they can't do is they can't tell your personal story for you. Look at this, 79% of congressional staff said that would be helpful or very helpful. Only 18%, two out of 10 staff, say they get it frequently or very frequently. You want to differentiate yourself from the other 26 meetings that office had on Tuesday? Tell a personal story. Tell a story about a client. Tell a story about a colleague. Tell a story about a community. Only you can do that. Your Washington office, your lobbyists can't do that. So this is why we're going to train you in storytelling, because this is the nexus of great advocacy, is having professional advocates talk about the macro policy and having citizen advocates talk about the impact in a very personal way. Now, when it comes to constituent reasoning for supporting or opposing the issue, 90% said they get the reasoning. 50% said they get it frequently. That's pretty good. One staffer said as follows, when I look at communications, it's not I'm just for or against something. I look, why are you for or against it? Members of Congress like drilling down. They want to know a little bit more. And finally, when it comes to the ask, almost everybody puts that in, more than half, 59% give an ask. So what are we talking about when we're talking about information about the impact on the district or state? Well, talk about the local impact in a couple ways. What's the total amount of money involved here in the real estate market? What is the number of customers or employees 
that are affected by this. Total wages. Multiplier effects. You guys have some of the best multiplier effects in the world. When you sell a house, who's involved there? Well, there's the lawyer I got to talk to when I sign the papers. There's the home inspector. I might be doing a home improvement and rebuild my kitchen. There's a lot of multiplier effects that you can talk about when you do this. One of the greatest multiplier effects I love is when we do uh, programs with educational groups and school groups. What's the multiplier effect of school lunches? Yes, it's moral and ethical to feed the child. What's the multiplier effect? Hungry kids can't learn. That's the bottom line. They're not going to learn. So think about those multiplier effects. Uh, one of the multiplier effects I love, the uh, American Academy for the Arts, which is the Association for All the Arts a few years ago, did this really great analysis on the multiplier effects. They didn't look at how much grants the government gave out for arts. They looked at how much money the local community theater spent on paint at the Sherwin-Williams. That's a multiplier effect. So think creatively. Most people don't think that way. And also what they're looking for, what are the benefits to the taxpayer? That's a really important, especially for Republicans is they're going to want to know, come on, what's the bottom line for taxpayers? What are they, what are they looking for? Let me amplify this with another uh, video that we have here from another chief of staff to uh, Congressman Rick Crawford. Um, Jonah Shumate, he's one of our rock star chiefs of staff that we work with on Capitol Hill. Um, he actually emailed yesterday. He's, he and his boss are going to start creating a podcast, which I think is incredibly creative, and he's asked for our advice on that. But when we were talking about what people wanted inside the communications, this is what Jonah had to say. Humanization of policy is always good because you get such an abstract idea about how something can be good or how it can be bad. But when you've had somebody who's actually experienced something in a very good way, it helps build you know, a compelling story and a narrative for keeping a policy or even getting rid of it. Um, the negativity also has the same effect, that if something has, has been in effect for a long time or going on, there's unintended consequences that you just don't see that comes from just something being in existence. And so being able to humanize something is always a very positive thing. So what's he talking about humanizing? What did I say? Personal story? Um, illustrating it in a way. And as Steph will tell you a little later today, it's okay to be graphic, and meaning offering details about what this is. If any of you, for example, have been uh, in either a flood zone that where a community hit by a hurricane or devastated by fires, talk about what it smelled like when you walked through the ruins. Talk about what it looked like when you saw that family going through that flood ravaged home and searching for simple treasures that was part of their lives a day ago and is now washed away. This is really important because most people don't do this. I never forget a story that happened to me. And this literally happened to me about 20 years ago. I was chief of staff for a freshman lawmaker. And um, my boss was out of town in Washington and was on a trip. And a couple of constituents had just come back from a trip to Sierra Leone. At the time, uh, there was a horrible civil war ravaging in Sierra Leone. And in, a, in just a vicious strategy, the combatants felt that the best way to deny the other side, potential recruits, was to go to young teenage boys and chop off their arm at the elbow. And I sat down with these constituents, because my boss wasn't there, I was chief of staff, and they said, first, we want to talk to you about what this is about. And they threw some photographs on the coffee table in front of me. I will never forget that moment. Okay? It's okay to be tough with these people. Most of the meetings they have are really boring, right? Most of them are not dealing with basic needs like housing, right? You, I mean, when the Society of American Florists, I love them to death, but when they go to Capitol Hill, you know what they're going for? $28 million more in research to make roses smell nice longer. Okay, that's really important if you're a florist because your product's going to last a little longer, but it's not the same as putting a roof over your head. It's just not the same thing. You've got a better story to tell, and take advantage of that and know that. I, I was... Uh, I was doing a focus group with uh, some legislative directors in the Senate, and, I, and this is before we even had a really long-term relationship, about five years ago. And I said, give me two groups that just wow you every time, every year. I'm not kidding. I, and I asked for volunteers. And one of the two groups, every, all five chiefs of staff said this was the National Association of Realtors. And I said, why do they have such influence of you? And they said, because there's a very good one. I meet with one. I don't know whether or not that person sitting across the table from me might have sold my boss his vacation home. <laughs> and I, it's always in the back of my mind. And so that's a connection that you might have. And by the way, don't tell the staff yes or no. Just let them keep guessing. 
you know, <laughs> that maybe they might have that connection. So keep that in mind that that's a power that you have over them. Okay, let's go talk about some written materials. Uh, what are they looking for and what are they not looking for in written materials? Now, a lot of the written materials are going to be provided for you, but this is what works and this is what doesn't work. One of the questions we asked Chiefs of Staff went like this. Most of the written materials left behind by constituents groups as part of an organized flying or lobby day are helpful to our policy decision making process. We asked this of Chiefs of Staff, do you agree or disagree with this statement? And here's the answer that we got. Unfortunately, only 37% would agree with that statement. Two out of three would say no so much. You're not gonna, fortunately, your friends here at the head table know this. They know what staffers are looking for and you're gonna get good stuff. That doesn't mean you can't augment it. It doesn't mean you can't bring in photographs and show people I am stunned at the people that do not walk in with one of these with a photograph that illustrates something about their community, a picture of a home, a picture of a homeowner smiling in front of that home. The picture's worth a thousand words. When you think about your strategies over the next few months, think about materials you're going to use back home to augment this. We are working with a group of food banks and we do a lot of training. They were one of the first groups that went through the Advocacy Academy. And in the final day, one of the food bank operators came here with this one sheet of paper and she had a map of the county that they served and there were little bits of food baskets all over here in the, on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, there was just a list of the uh, numbers. So this many families, this many meals. I said, wow. What kind of software did you use to create this? And she looked at me, she said, Microsoft Word? <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's that simple. It's like they're not looking for complex stuff and, and spreadsheets just don't sell the same way that graphics do, information graphics. Um, one of the questions we asked to try to drill down a little further, when meeting with a group of constituents as part of an organized fly-in or lobby day, please indicate the helpfulness of the following written material. So this is what they're looking for and we primarily were looking for in length. So what are they looking for? Um, they're looking for a one, uh, I'm sorry, a five page leave behind. Only 18% said that would be helpful or somewhat helpful. They don't need doorstops. And they'll politely take that five page, that 20 page report, they'll smile, they'll nod. You know, they're not gonna tell you it's not helpful. They're politicians and you're voters. So they're not gonna tell you when you screw up. They'll tell us and they'll tell us in anonymous surveys. Follow up emails with attachment. 86% said that was very helpful or helpful. And let me stop on this for a second because we're gonna talk more about follow-up materials later. But what that means is you're gonna get something really valuable when you meet with a member of Congress. You're gonna get an email address of that legislative assistant and you're gonna know that they handle either tax or housing issues for that member of Congress. And you're gonna put that together. One of the pieces of the bio that um, Victoria left out was I took a five year sojourn from CMF and I started an internet company and sold software here in Washington DC. And we came up with the formula of how to attach email addresses to legislative staff names, to issue areas, to members of Congress. I sold the company three years later. My kids are going to college on that idea. It's a very valuable piece of information having that email address. Follow up, send the attachment. They live in their computers, they live on their handhelds and do it really close to it. And what they're really looking for is when you walk into the office is the one or two page leave behind. 94% said that would be somewhat helpful or helpful. One staffer said it to this way, said it this way, please do not bring me glossy folders with tons of background information. It's going right into the recycle bin. So one of the other things we learned about building relationships with lawmakers is they want to be prepared for your meetings. They want to make sure that the boss knows the story of, of what's uh, uh, happening uh, about this particular issue. And to get that, that in a little more granular, we asked a question in our last survey we hadn't asked before that went like this. Some groups provide information to congressional staff prior to their meetings. How helpful are each of these elements when provided by groups and or constituents before a meeting? So I'm going to show you what is helpful or very helpful. This is what they're looking for before you meet with them. This is what they want. So they want to know the key constituents who are interested in the issue. 60% said that would be somewhat or very helpful. Now, what that means is that can be the number of people in your community. It could be people who might be president or chair of the Rotary Club or the Chamber of Commerce, but they want to know who might be interested in this issue. 
They want to know a proposed solution or alternative. Now, here's where the legislative staff is asking you to do their work for them. Right. They really want you to find out a little bit more about the issue. And that's also evidenced by the fact they want to know the bill number. They don't want to look it up. I know that sounds crazy, but they're looking for you to be their legislative researchers. Go ahead. Do it for them. You don't want them getting it from someplace else, right? Do you want them to get it from Google or from the National Association of Realtors? So give them this information. Description of the issue or the problem. They want to know a little bit more, what is at stake here? Remember, they want to know the impact. They want to understand this. This is especially true, by the way, for freshman offices. And we now have one out of, almost one out of four offices in the House of Representatives are freshman lawmakers. They are brand new to all of these issues. About half of the legislative staff have not worked on Capitol Hill before. So when you go and you talk about flood insurance to a freshman office, I am pretty sure it's the first time that legislative assistant has ever talked about flood insurance with anybody. You are their expert. The Senate's a little different. The average age and tenure of a Senate legislative assistant, they're subject matter experts. But in the House of Representatives, big differential, big difference. They need you to be the expert. And so describing the problem is really important to them. They want to know local groups that are affected by the issue. Who is affected by this? Is it businesses? Is it particular communities? Is it geographic or demographic? Is it separated by income? They're trying, they have to provide this analysis to the member of Congress. They'd also like to know facts and hard data about the impact on the district or state, if you have anything in advance. And finally, they want to know a specific request for action. What are they going to ask me? The, I, I'm telling you, 15 minutes before your meeting with that member of Congress, he's going to call in that legislative assistant, and they're going to say, what do they want from me? And give me a quick briefing on what this meeting is going to be about. Remember, they got 13 meetings a day. They're not going to do a lot of the reading ahead of time. One chief of staff said it to me this way. He said, if you want to get in the memo, I prepare for the boss ahead of time. Give it to me in a format I can cut and paste. Said another way at CMF in one of our reports, think leave, don't think leave behind. Think read ahead. And we're going to give you a copy of this report, Citizen-Centric Advocacy, the Untapped Power of Citizen Engagement, as part of your training program. So um, before we leave you and go into the, the next segment, I want to uh, leave a little time for Q&A. So um, I'm just going to open up the floor now and have you give a little bit of opportunity to run a little ahead of schedule. So go ahead. I, I'm sure there's some House of Cards fans out there uh, just shaking your faith in the universe. So go ahead and ask some questions. Yes, sir. There's a microphone over here and over here. Oh, he wrote it down. He even wrote it down. I like this. Yeah. Do it when you meet with your member. Do the same thing. Okay. <laughs> uh, my name is John Lucero, and I'm uh, with Congresswoman Deb Holland. Uh, my question is, what's the difference between form letters and call to action? I mean, how is that? How is call to action more effective than a form letter? Um, you want to take that one? Uh, <laughs> well, you, you were motioned, so I thought you, that was, I'll answer the question. Our calls for action, yeah, your calls for action, yeah. yeah. So, so I'm Jim McGregor, for those who don't know me. Mac, everybody calls me Mac. Um, so our calls for actions are form letters. But the one thing I will say about NAR is that the volume of calls for action and those emails that go through um, is much higher than other organizations. So I believe that plays a part of this. Brad may disagree with me, but that's okay. No, that's okay. Um, and the other part of this is that it's all of you who are following up behind those emails. That's the big, that's the big piece of this, is we're not just sending in emails. We're doing social media. We're doing some phone calls. We're doing face-to-face -face conversations that you all are having with your members of Congress. Our lobbyists are uh, walking into offices and talking to those uh, potential voter uh, uh, members of Congress that might be able to change their vote or come with us on the issue. So it's not only the emails we're doing, um, it's, uh, it, they are form letters, but it's that along with a very larger strategy of all the other pieces that help us get to where we need to be on Capitol Hill. So hopefully that helps the answer. And just to amplify, when you get that call to action, and I mentioned this earlier, it is essential that you personalize the top of it. 
And uh, I'll give you an example of, of a campaign that was very successful. Uh, we were doing one of our webinars for our partners, uh, like you all, it was a different group. And they asked us, they want to bring in people from the back office, a legislative correspondent. Now, a legislative correspondent for a member of the House of Representatives is one of the most junior positions. The average age is 24 years old. Um, they haven't been in the office for about a year. Yet they are the gatekeepers for the mail. They determine what the member of Congress reads. They determine when it gets up, flows through the system. They determine what the legislative assistant, legislative director and chief of staff read. They're the ones who say, this is important, read this. And we had this legislative correspondent on one of our webinars. And she was, I asked her a question. I said, well, can you think of a campaign that really stuck with you that was sent in, one of the action alerts that, that Mac was describing? And she said, oh yeah, I, I remember um, there was this one campaign, a regulation had been uh, put forward by the EPA and there was this, it affected a lot of small businesses. And these small businesses wanted us to overturn the regulation by um, passing legislation. And I remember every one of those that we got in there was a, um, an email that personalized the top, that talked about a little bit of the impact. We have this many small businesses in our district. We have this many uh, people that are affected by that. And we ended up co-sponsoring legislation because of that campaign. And I said, well, how many of those individualized emails did you get? She says, I don't know, about 20 or 30. And then I asked her, I said, have you ever had any other instances where you got a mass campaign, but it was not personalized? It was just all identical. And she said, oh yeah, we get those all the time. And I asked her, did you end up taking the action requested? And these were exact words. I don't remember. It's literally, you saw the differential of what happens when you personalize these messages. It makes a huge difference. It makes a huge difference when you actually personalize it in some way and they will read it. In fact, the software has gotten so sophisticated on the Hill is the chief of staff will get a report and it will report out the percentage of emails they got that were individualized and the average personalization or individualization. That's how much they're looking at. And the campaigns that personalize more, they get more attention. Next question. Good morning. Good morning. Sarah Kahlo, Ohio 16. All right. New member of Congress, not new FPC. Um, Who's your new member? Anthony Gonzalez. OK, great. The Ohio State University. Um, <laughs> Tell me about this slideshow because in Ohio we are doing a, an FPC roundtable of all of us on March 1st and for the seasoned FPCs that would be a great reminder of what's new and what's changing. Are you going to share that with us? Absolutely. In fact, as part of this program that you participate in, um, we would be delighted to share through Mac and Victoria um, copies of our slides that you would like to use. Um, you're you're going to see the one thing we have a lot of at the Congressional Management Foundation is PowerPoint slides. Um, as you're going to realize at the end of this program, um, it, when you get through in May, and so we'd be happy to, to share those. A couple tips that we'll offer, and this is kind of a train the trainer thing. If you are going to be working with other people um, that are going to be doing this, here's a couple tips. People are intimidated when, as you said, it's hugging a porcupine, right? They're intimidated by that process. So the first thing is go slow. Don't ask them to jump into the deep end of the pool and say, why don't you invite your lawmaker to your office and have them meet the other realtors? Or No, don't go slow. Have them first, you know, uh, maybe just write an email to their member of Congress. Um, or if they're really comfortable, going to a town hall meeting is a great way to get people comfortable because you may not have to ask a question or you may have to ask a question. So that's another way that you can actually improve and build that relationship with that individual. Um, secondly, um, and, and you'll see this in one of the programs we do later, uh, the second webinar I think you'll be doing is uh, called Building Assets and Building Out Your Network. And you're going to learn some of the tools that are available to you, like how to write a letter to the editor and how to use social media to connect with lawmakers. The point there being not everybody has the same interest or strategy or comfort level in using a particular advocacy strategy. Some may feel comfortable writing a letter to the editor. Others may not feel comfortable writing a letter to the editor. So keep that in mind that you're going to give them different. If you give them a variety of strategies to use, then they can pick and choose. And they're much more likely to take action. 
And, and keeping in mind that the number of people that interact with Congress on an annual basis, even though the numbers are really high in terms of writing those identical form campaigns, taking that next step and individualizing it, or going to a town hall meeting, or setting up an event in the district or state, now you're going into a really small percentage of Americans that do that, really, really small. So keep that in mind that you're really going into this elite group of people that are building these relationships with lawmakers in a way that most Americans do not. I usually tell people at the beginning, this is a path to being the most powerful citizens in America, and I'm not kidding, because most people don't do that. The other challenge that they have is most people, a lot of people are mean to their members of Congress. You know, they're just downright nasty. There was a guy that went to a town hall meeting in Wisconsin last year in 2017, and he had a handmade sign, and the sign said, I didn't come here to listen to you, I came here to yell. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't yell. It's not exactly out of Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. You know, it doesn't work. Um, I was working with a group, and this was in 2017. I could be telling you the same story from 2011. Um, on, the Dem on the other side, because they were also big protests. And in 2017, this, this individual, he was an environmentalist, and he went to a, a office of a member of the Republican leadership last year, and he was complaining to me. He said, we went there with signs, and we were chanting, and he wouldn't meet with us. And I said, well, did you, someone phone ahead and ask for a meeting? I don't know. You know, simple courtesy. You know, just simple courtesy. If someone walks in, if you're doing business with somebody, it's natural that you're going to, frankly, connect with people that are polite. So we often say politely and persistently persuade politicians. Next question from the audience. Over here, yeah. Davids. So I'll point out this is the third freshman connection we've had here, so maybe there's a trend here. Yeah. I was just curious. Uh, I've seen a lot of stats on written emails, getting your topic to the top, but what about video? A personal video story message that we're sending to our uh, representatives? Obviously, we're a huge fan of video, and so if you're able to do that, here's a couple tips on using video with members of Congress. The most effective is in person, where you bring the video with you and you show the member. You know, Bill couldn't be here, and so I'm showing this video. A few years ago, um, one of the best, most powerful videos I remember was done by, and I'm going to get the association wrong, but basically the National Association of Gamblers. I know, not the most lovable group in the world, but wait, you hear the story. So this, this guy was here on a fly-in, and he shows this video that this constituent had created. He just stuck the iPhone up in front of him, and he said, Started the question, he's in a wheelchair, he says, I have cerebral palsy. It prevents me from coming to Washington, Congressman, but I want to tell my story. I started having fun with poker when my grandmother taught me how to do it when I was six years old. By the end of the story, he had mentioned both the fun at school and church associated, so he's gotten his grandmother, school, and church associated in a positive way with gambling. <laughs> Again, if that guy can do it, you guys can do it, okay? So first and foremost, uh, do it in a way that, you know, bring it into the audience, bring it, bring it in front of them, put it in their face. And by the way, it doesn't have to be in Washington, it could be the district office, it can be with the district director, but having that little video, um, especially if you're talking about something where the visuals are powerful, like we talked about flood insurance, we've talked about disasters, things like that, it doesn't have to be that, but the point is having visuals. That's for in-person. For emailing videos, this is a really, really, really important point. They have to know it's there. So if you just send them an email saying video, they're not gonna look at it. Because they say video, oh, I have no idea how long it is. I have no idea what's in it. It could be inappropriate, and I don't want my staff looking over my shoulder while I'm looking at something. You know, I have no idea who this person is. But if you know them and you have built this relationship, so you, you may need to phone them and say, hey, I sent you this video. It's really important. And I'll tell you why they're terrified of not looking at the videos, is they're terrified they are gonna have the person with cerebral palsy talking about not gambling, but the ravages of the disease, and the kid's eight years old, and they don't look at the video, and suddenly the member of Congress is looking at a letter to the editor which says, I sent a video of my son talking about his disease, and the congressman didn't even look at it. You know, that's what they're terrified of. So giving them information that there's something valuable in this video is another really, really good tactic that you can employ 
And I, I, I got to tell you, I've seen just when people use it, I talked about the Sierra Loan example. It's unbelievable the number of people, a very infinitesimal percentage of people use videos and photos when lobbying members of Congress. It's crazy, but it's, it's remarkably low. Increasingly, we're seeing more infographics just because we're becoming a more infographic-y society. So we're seeing a little bit more like that, but still, I mean, in the, in the 27 interactions on a daily basis, two, three, might have some extra visual other than text. So it really differentiates yourself in your meetings with lawmakers. Yeah. How you doing? Uh, Nick Manis from New Jersey. I'm the FPC for uh, Cory Booker. And now that, uh, now that he's uh, running for president, for those of us who's member of Congre a member of Congress or, or uh, is running for president, does that change the strategy in any way? So he said, for those of you members who are running for Congress uh, who are represented by members running for Congress, so that's half of the room. <laughs> it will be... It, it possibly, I'm not kidding, for the first time in American history, it could be one-tenth of the Senate. Literally, it could be one out of ten senators are running for office and running for president. How does that change? Well, one, if you're from Iowa, Cory Booker wants to know you, <laughs> or New Hampshire. He's expanding his relationship base, if you hadn't noticed, and I'm not kidding. I mean, I'm really not kidding. It's, it's, it's like if you're walking down the hallway and you're from Iowa and you see... Senator Harris or Booker or Gillihan and say, hi, I'm from Iowa. I swear she will stop <laughs> and shake your hand. It's like, oh, great. I don't have to go to Des Moines to get this vote. Awesome. Um, you know, so that's one thing is that it, they expand their base. Secondly, um, it is very likely when you interact with those senators that you're not going to have a chance to talk with the senator. You're going to be dealing more with their staff because, you know, daddy or mommy just got another family and it's called the presidential campaign. So they had the district office, the state office, and now it's the presidential campaign, and they're now divided in their time. And so it's a little bit more of a challenge. Um, this, by the way, for those of you not just who are represented by candidates for president, but this also goes true for members who are committee chairmen or who are head of major caucuses. And the major caucuses are the Hispanic Caucus, the Black Caucus, the Women's Caucus, the Progressive Caucus, and the Freedom Caucus. If you are working with a member who is head of the biotechnology caucus for left-handed business people, don't worry about that. The ones that are the really important caucuses that make a difference are the Black Caucus, the Hispanic Caucus, the Progressive Caucus, the Women's Caucus, and the Freedom Caucus. That's, that's it. After that, everybody else is just a nobody. Sorry. Do not tell people I said that, or the biotechnology caucus is going to get really mad at me. But they just don't spend a lot of time on those activities. So what does that mean? It means they are divided. It also means they are more powerful. So who's here from Wisconsin? You're from Wisconsin? Okay, Mark Pocan, chair of the Progressive Caucus. When he speaks, another 50 other progressives listen to that person. Who's here from North Carolina? Mark Meadows, head of the Freedom Caucus. At the other end of the table, you guys should get together, try to get Pocan and Meadows together. We've been working on it. We can't make it happen. Because um, that's the top polar opposites. But the point is, they speak for others. Their voice counts. It means it's harder to connect with them, but when you do connect with them. So for those folks, what's the strategy? Connecting with them in the district or state. Because when they're in Washington, they have twice the number of meetings that the other lawmakers have. So that's just a little more challenge. So meeting back in Washington, that's the strategy. And those caucuses, I can tell you right now, especially on the Democratic side, are incredibly powerful groups. They speak with a great deal of power and their leverage is I cannot underestimate how powerful they are. We saw it during the speaker's debate on whether Pelosi was going to be able to be speaker or not. Fran from Minnesota. So with this big freshman class, we're seeing some of them get a great deal of publicity and apparent power very quickly that don't necessarily represent one of those caucuses. How have they done it? Well, if you're an attractive 29-year-old young woman who used to be a bartender and um, <laughs> knows how to use social media, that's one way. Um, if you're the first Muslim woman elected, that's another way. The first uh, American Indian woman, uh, another way. Deb Holland, another way. Um, I, you know, I, I mean, AOC is a phenom in, in, of herself. Uh, of a different, and I'm talking about Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who beat Joe Crowley in New York, 
and is a freshman lawmaker and gained a seat on the House Financial Services Committee, uh, as well as two, two other freshman members, um, which is really unusual. Normally, they hold those seats on the A committee. That's an A committee. They're, they go A, B, C. Um, for members who are in, frankly, uh, trouble electorally, so they want to give them more power, and instead they gave it to the freshmen. Um, and, and part of it is their narrative, their story, right? I mean, that's her story. That's her power. Yes, she also has a, 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 an incredible personality um, that comes through on social media. I, I was amused that she tried to train other members of Congress on how to use social media. And I mean, that's like Picasso training people to paint. It's, it's you know, no, there's certain people that are just gifted and her personality um, is just remarkable and her ability and her wit on social media is unparalleled right now. Um, she's got more followers on Twitter than Nancy Pelosi. It's a, it's a perfect example yeah, it's a perfect example, Fran said, of storytelling. It's her story, it's her narrative. The media love that and, and that's it. And you have a lot of members of Congress in the freshman class that have incredible stories. You have former CIA uh, agents, literally former spies. You have more women veterans than at any other time in uh, American history in Congress. And it's their stories. By the way, in play to that, one of the things you're going to learn a little bit about is about researching um, their members of Congress and, and finding a little connection to them in some ways that can really play up and, and, and advance your cause. And doing a little more research, one of the tools we're going to encourage you to do and teach you how to do that is you, by the end of this program, will not only be able to fill out that one pager on the member of Congress, you'll be able to do a biography in a way that no one else knows, stuff that's not on Wikipedia, stuff that's not in their official bio. Um, it's, it's a real quick trivia question. Um, uh, folks from Ohio, where's, where's Ohio? OK, Ohio, right, right. You have great senators, Sherry Brown and uh, Sherrod, but he goes by Sherry, Sherrod Brown and uh, Rob Portman. Democrat, Republican, wonderful public servants. We've had the honor of working with both of them. I'm going to give you a grass tops, literally advocacy 201 question. There's no reason why, Ohio, you should know the answer to this question, but I'm going to try it anyway. Senator Brown has on his lapel a pin that's not the American flag, but it's a canary. Why does he have a canary on his lapel? No reason you would know this. You know why? Why? Coal mine. Coal mine. That's right. Connection to coal mine. His grandfather was a doctor, general practitioner, working in eastern Ohio, where they had coal mines, and many of his patients had black lung disease. So it's an homage to him. You won't find that on his website. You won't find out in his Wikipedia page. But if you know that, and you work for the American Medical Association, you walk into that office five steps ahead of the game than the next person coming in, because he has a connection to you. You're going to learn how to research who may have a connection. Now, of course, it's a little easier for members of Congress because they all live in homes, you know, so you already have that connection. But is there something else that connects them in some material way? Um, maybe their daughter is a real estate agent. Who knows? Or a broker. You don't know. Those are the things you want to drill down a little bit deeper. Nick, one more question. Hi, I'm Ed Beers from right next door in Maryland and FPC for Andy Harris. What is the impact when you hear at a local or a national level a call and a phone number put out to say, call your congressman? How does that affect them? Do you guys do that a lot? Where you ask them to phone? Not a lot. Not that, not do it sometimes. Now, you don't do it a lot. You know why? It doesn't work. That's why. When you, when you phone a member of Congress, you can communicate one of two data points, yay or nay, pro or con. That's it. And they tally it up, and they may or may not give it if it's a to the member of Congress. When it's really busy, they will not. Last year, let me just give you some data points. There was one day during when things were really hot in the first three months of the Trump administration, one leadership office got 1.3 million phone calls in one day. Tried to get through the switchboard. Four people are answering the phone. They're still in therapy. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's incredible. There was a campaign last year, group, Progressive groups spend $2 million on a phone campaign, right out the door. It just, it, now, where it does matter sometimes is if you know that office, if you have a relationship with that legislative assistant or that district director, yes, using one of these to talk to them on the phone 
is very valuable. I have a really tough time sometimes, sorry if there's millennials in the room, I apologize, but you can use this to talk as well as text, folks, okay? And I have a real tough time communicating them, call them. We have a rule at CMF, you never tell anybody no via text, you call them up. Don't give people bad news in writing, call them up. So yeah, if you, if, if you are asked to connect with a lawmaker, or the staffer, and you already know them, phone them, that's perfect. But phone campaigns, going to the intern on the front desk, that's not gonna cut it. So with that, Mac told me that's the last question. We're going to be taking a 15 minute break, right? 15 minute break? Yep, yeah. everybody back at five minutes of 10. So thank you. Thank you.